This is what your therapist never told you about intrusive thoughts. What if I told you that your mind is trying to do something? It's trying to do a long-held survival technique to help you preserve your life and keep safe and process your emotions, but nobody's ever told you how to use it. So there you are, driving home at the end of a long day of work. You're emotionally, physically exhausted. Your tank is empty. Your mind is off in the clouds as you drive the same route that you've driven every single day that you come back home from work. Until that thought, pops in your head. And as your hands lazily grip the steering wheel and you're listening to that comfort tunes on the radio, you think, what if I jerked the wheel? What if, what if I went right off the edge of the bridge? What if I went right into that brick wall or right through that storefront instead of taking that left or right turn? And you go, oh my God, what the hell is wrong with me? Why, why would I have this thought? What, why would I think this thing? And so then you immediately feel guilty and ashamed. You feel like, oh, I must be so fucked up. I must be, I must be a goddamn mess. But you're not. Honestly, I'm offended for you that your therapist never showed you this, but here I am today, maybe making it free on YouTube. If you like this kind of stuff, hit subscribe, by the way. What is your brain trying to do? Believe it or not, intrusive thoughts come from a different part of our brain. That's why they don't make sense. There's two parts, right? This part up here and then this part back here. This happens all automatically. It's where your emotions come from. And so those intrusive thoughts, as we know, are not controllable. They come from the same area of our brain that our emotions do. That's why if you feel ashamed or embarrassed, you really can't just turn that off. Like if I say I'm going to focus on this screen and then I say I'm going to focus on this screen, conscious choice. I can make that choice. Emotions, if you feel sad, you can't just stop feeling sad. It's an unfortunate reality, but it has some therapeutic benefits. Those intrusive thoughts, they come from here. They don't operate and they don't work from the same logic that your executive brain does. And so they often get misinterpreted and people feel super ashamed and super guilty, but they have a very important purpose. And I wish people would say this more. Those intrusive thoughts are actually survival techniques. Because by thinking of bad outcomes, by thinking of the worst thing that you could possibly do, it's actually helping you remember and stay safe to not do those things in the present. For example, right? They, they say making mistakes is the best way to learn things, right? Because why? When you make a mistake, you learn how to not do something. You learn the dark and shadow sides of the, of the goals and the opportunities that you would like to experience. So by driving the car and thinking about driving into a storefront, well, obviously you don't want to make that literal mistake, but by fantasizing about this and by thinking about it, you think, wow, I realize how important it is to pay attention to the road. I realize how precious and fragile my life is. I realize how much independence and control I have in my life. I realize what a responsibility I have to the other people around me to keep them safe too, because it's very easy for me to hurt somebody without actually intending to. And this is what people don't understand. It happens in all sorts of scenarios, in all sorts of situations. We have to work with ourselves, not against ourselves. And you need to work with your intrusive thoughts, not against your intrusive thoughts. So I'm going to teach you the most important things today about what your intrusive thoughts can teach you and how you should be working with them. You were built to be ashamed of your intrusive thoughts. You were raised and groomed to be afraid and ashamed and embarrassed by those things that pop into your head. And I want to be the one to take that away from you and say, hey, you don't, you give that back. You don't need that. You let me have it. <laughs> you go and be proud of yourself and start to listen to your mind and not be so critical of yourself. Number one is you have to understand where these thoughts come from. Like I said, they're automatic. They come from the unconscious part of your brain. And so being unconscious and emotional, you have to use the language of the unconscious, which coincidentally is the same language of dreams. That's why I do dream interpretation as part of my practice as a mental health counselor. The unconscious mind will often show you the things that you want in the negative. For example, you will often have nightmares when you've had a really, really good day or when you're on your way to achieving something that you want because your mind is trying to understand and rehearse all the possible negative outcomes. Again, mistakes are the way that human beings learn. So if I can make those mistakes in my dreams or if I can make those mistakes in my intrusive thoughts, I don't have to make those mistakes in my waking life. So for example, by seeing car crashes, by hearing stories about car crashes, I don't have to make a car crash when I'm learning how to drive. I can be like, oh, I can learn through stories. 
That's what our brain is doing. That's what your brain is doing when it has an intrusive thought. The best thing to do, and my number one piece of advice, is to go with them. When you start to push against those intrusive thoughts and try and push them out of your mind, just by putting that kind of oppressive energy into it, it actually makes them bigger. And you know this from, from being a kid. If you want to make sure that a child does something, tell them not to do it. That way they'll be sure to go and do that thing. It's, it's infuriating for parents, but children don't have the conscious brain to say, oh, they told me not to, so I shouldn't. You just said don't do something, and now all they can think about is that thing, so they go and they end up doing it. Your child brain back here does the same exact thing. So instead, go with them. If you're driving and you think about crashing off the side of a bridge, have a fantasy about it. You know that you're going to drive safe. You're more than capable. You've done it 100,000 times. But fantasize in your head. Okay, I drive off the bridge. What would happen? Would the car hit there and then flip over? Would I go into the water? Would I have to break the window to bust out? Would I be able to open the door and swim out? Would somebody come for me? Would they have to helicopter evac me out? It, I mean, it's all in your head. It's active imagination. Use your imagination. Go with it. And I am telling you, I, I almost promise you, right? But as a therapist, I can't promise you. I'm telling you that by engaging in this and in incorporating your active imagination, those thoughts will start to come down. And there's a lot of weird ones that you can have. One of the most common ones is when you're holding a baby or you know, you're know you with a child, is thinking about terrible things to do to that baby or child. My number one thing, this is a me one, is I'm holding my child and I'm like, what if I just dropped you right on the floor? Bam, right on the concrete. Of course, I love that child more than anything in the world. And I'm not going to do that. But my mind is saying, hey, this baby's precious. Pay extra special attention. Don't get distracted. Make sure that you're holding them safe. And by giving me that intrusive thought, it helps me double down on being safe and caring for that baby in the way that they should. I'm sure that you've had that thought too. It's probably the number one most common intrusive thought that people have. My second recommendation is to share them. And if you don't have good friends around who aren't gonna judge you, because that's super, super important, don't share your intrusive thoughts with people who are gonna judge the hell out of you. That's not gonna be helpful for anybody. And it really indicates their lack of self-awareness as well. You don't want that kind of friend in your life. And if it's only your therapist, then share your intrusive thoughts with your therapist. A good therapist will be okay with them and know how to handle them. But if you've got good friends in your life, They'll laugh about it with you. They'll be like, oh yeah, you had that intrusive thought? Look at this one that I had. And you'll share. And by doing that, you'll see, even by watching this video right now, you're learning that you're not crazy, that your mind is not against you. It's just misunderstood. And there's so many wonderful <laughs> and silly intrusive thoughts. Another one of my favorites is I'd be sitting in church. It'd be quiet. They're like praying to Jesus and the whole thing. And I'm like, thought pops in my head. What if I just lost control and just screamed, fuck, in the middle of church? what would happen? And so I was like, oh my gosh, this is, a, this is a demon inside of my mind. This is Satan trying to plague my thoughts. And I'm like, no, no, no. Now that I'm a mental health counselor and I understand psychology, I'm like, oh, that's a funny intrusive thought that a child would have inside a church. Maybe you've had it too. Another great one is violence or illegal activities, right? What if I stole that thing and put it in my pocket? You know, what if I hurt that person who cut me off in line? Those are normal thoughts and you have to vent out those emotions. You have to release them. Otherwise, they become trapped. And the more that you press them down, the more likely you are to start becoming addicted to substances, the more likely you are to act out on them, the more likely you are to lose connection and start to feel disassociative symptoms. There's a lot of things that can happen by pressing these emotions down. And so by learning and accepting them and understanding them, it's going to be great. I'll give you one last example before I before I log off and leave you with this to think about for the rest of your week. Another really, really good one. I had a friend who was trying to do some some weird stuff, right? They were, they were trying to get me in an argument with my spouse. So we're at this, we're at a bar, we're at this table, and we're sitting down, and this person likes to play the truth or truth game. It's like truth or dare, except it's all truths. And so, I don't know, it's kind of fun to begin with, but then it gets it gets weird. And so it got weird this time. And this person asks me, Jesse, have you ever, and my wife is sitting right next to me, have you ever thought about one of your clients sexually? They're trying, they're trying to get me to have an argument with my wife. It was, it was pretty, pretty nasty stuff. And so they were not ready for my answer, though. I looked them straight in the eye and I said, I think about every single one of my clients sexually. Now, before you cancel me on the internet, think about it. Of course, I have to think about each of my clients sexually because I have to think about 
how they're going to relate in their relationships, what kind of sexual dysfunctions they might be experiencing, how they're going to be empathetic and caring for their partner in a sexual experience. I'm not fantasizing about me having sex with them, which I think is what she was trying to get to. But I am thinking about the sexual identity of each of my clients. But we've become so accustomed and ashamed about sex and intrusive thoughts that it's a way for other people to control us and manipulate us, make us feel ashamed, make us feel embarrassed. And our culture uses shame and guilt, I think this is from religion, to control and manipulate and make us do the things that they want us to do rather than accepting human beings for what they are. We all have intrusive thoughts. We all have sexual thoughts. Those are helpful. For me, by having these sexual thoughts and thinking about how this person I'm sitting with might experience their own sexuality, it helps me empathetically connect with them and it helps me guide them through whatever struggle they might have. If I shut my mind down to the sexuality of that person sitting across from me, there is a whole aspect of their life that I'm not going to be able to help them with. It comes about because of our, our history in Greek philosophy. Now, I'm not going to go too far into this. I don't want to bore anybody. But Marcus Aurelius and the Stoics really thought and believed that we should regiment and be in total control of our emotions. Well, obviously, it didn't stick. I mean, it did for quite some time, actually, and there's still some Stoics around, but it's just, it's not a very exciting way to live. And you really can't turn off your emotions. These Stoics strove to have so much control over their feelings that they were neither happy nor sad. And that really is the shameful and scary truth. Like, if you want to be in control of your feelings, you can't just cut off the negative stuff. You have to also cut off the good stuff. And so these Stoics would pride themselves on never going out and partying, never having a good time, never being happy. The ultimate Stoic flex was if you lost your child, you didn't cry. How fucked up is that? Right? You know, when your kid has a birthday or you, know, you see them do some great accomplishment, you don't act proud and happy and accomplished and prideful of them either. It, it just makes no sense to me. And I, I've, I've done a podcast on my critique of the Stoics, which may be a little bit self-inflated of me, but I don't care. I just think it's stupid. Because here's the thing. If 100% of people have emotions, right? Okay, maybe 99.99%. There may be somebody out there. 100% of people have emotions. And you're telling me that emotions are a problem. That just doesn't make sense. That's like saying... Well, 100% of people have noses, but that's not the way that people should be. If the majority of people have a certain thing, that's the way that humans are supposed to be. Intrusive thoughts are good for you. Engage with them. Use your active imagination. Share them with a friend who cares and let your mind teach you what safety things it wants to help you understand. Remember, your mind's not against you. It's just misunderstood. All right, get out of here. Go be weird.